Canals, Part 1, The Erie Canal. And her name is Sal. 15 miles on the Erie Canal. Table She's of Contents, Canals, worker, Part 1, The Erie Canal. All about the Erie Canal, the Erie Canal. its history, We've construction, and effects on New York day. City, New York Little State, lumber, and the entire United and States. And we know Dr. Sidney Soclough, Dr. Sidney22 at gmail.com, 2023. Narration by Dr. Sidney Soclough, Zoe Phonemes, and Nathan Cole Tove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash YT Navigator. Canals facilitated nearly every aspect of industrialization. Britain's first commercial canal, the Bridgewater Canal opened in 1761 and at once showed itself superior to all other methods of transport. A horse pulling a floating barge could draw almost 50 times as much weight as it could with a wagon. Canals made it possible to carry bulk solids, such as coal, iron ore, bricks, timber, clay, and grain. Building canals, especially across hilly country, proved an immense technical challenge but inspired highly innovative technologies. Canals, which accelerated bulk transports across Britain, caught on rapidly between 1770 and the 1830s, when they were eclipsed by the faster and more efficient railways. The Erie Canal The Erie Canal Inspired by the English and Dutch systems of canals, Americans began to see the possibility of man-made waterways early in their history. George Washington perhaps spurred the activity by publicly wishing that Americans had the wisdom to improve our system of waterways. By the 1790s, Small canals were being attempted but were slow to construct and underfinanced. Such public luminaries as Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Mifflin supported these canals. Thus, despite the problems the canal builders found, improving the nation's waterways was inextricably linked with Republican sentiment and nationalism. Much of the difficulty in early canal building was simply a lack of elementary knowledge. Americans were not used to such improvements. Engineers were either sent to England for training or, more often, expected to work out for themselves how to take a level, how to dig a channel, remove tree roots, dispose of tons of earth, mix underwater cement, create locks and a hundred other things. The fact that, for the most part, American engineers, surveyors, and laborers could build a system of canals from this beginning was widely hailed around the country as further proof that America was an inspired nation, whose ingenuity would carry it far. The earliest canal ventures began in Pennsylvania and Virginia to improve transportation to the Ohio Valley in 1791. The Pennsylvania legislature incorporated a private group of leading citizens and started work on the Schuylkill and Susquehanna Canal. An English engineer, William Weston, was brought to America to supervise construction. As with many canals, the work was done in sections, and the short portage canal at the Great Falls on the lower Susquehanna was completed in 1797, becoming the first working canal in Pennsylvania. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison supported another venture begun in 1785, the Potomac Company. Originally intended to connect the Potomac to the Ohio River, the canal was scaled back like many early projects. 
It eventually became an improvement for the Potomac trade. Numerous other small canals were begun with grand ambitions and became controlled partners to the larger rivers they followed. Why didn't Boston or Philadelphia or Baltimore or even Charleston rise to become the center of the musical and dramatic theater in the United States? Why not Market Street in Philadelphia? Or Boylston Street in Boston? Charles Street in Baltimore? Or even Charleston in South Carolina? All of these were great ports in colonial days and of a size to rival New York City. The answer we has to do primarily with geography and access to the hinterland. And the great barrier posed by the Appalachian Mountains. The original 13 colonies were confined to a strip along the Atlantic coast between the ocean and the Appalachian Mountains. After the French and Indian War ended in 1763, the entire territory between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River was open for settlement. The Appalachian Mountains were a formidable barrier for the transportation of people, agricultural produce, and goods between the Northwest Territory and the regions east of the mountains. These are the Appalachian Mountains. This is the Northwest Territory in the region west of the Ohio River. These are the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 allowed for the creation of as many as five states in the Northwest portion of the Ohio Valley on lines initially laid out in 1784 by Thomas Jefferson. Known as the Northwest Territory. The new federal lands we east of the Mississippi and between the Ohio River and the Great Lakes. The Appalachian Mountains were a formidable barrier for the transportation of people, agricultural produce, and goods between the Northwest Territory and the regions east of the mountains. As the settlement of the region west of the mountains increased in the early 1800s, there was increasing interest in establishing a transportation route across the mountains. Canals were the lowest cost means of transportation before the advent of the railroads in the mid-1800s. The Appalachian Mountains were a barrier to transportation from Maine to northern Georgia. There was only one gap that made a canal feasible. That was the Mohawk Valley in upstate New York. This is the Mohawk Valley. In the early 1800s, a canal was proposed to be dug from the Hudson River near Albany through the Mohawk River Valley to Lake Erie. This would establish an all-water transportation route from New York City, up the Hudson River to Albany, and then on the Erie Canal, from Albany to Lake Erie near Buffalo. The result was the Erie Canal. Governor DeWitt Clinton and the state of New York were able to build a waterway that was 4 feet deep, 40 feet wide, and 363 miles long, connecting the Hudson River at Albany to Lake Erie near Buffalo. Distance and Travel Times Length of the original Erie Canal Albany to Buffalo 363 miles, number of locks in 1825, 83, travel time from Albany to Buffalo in 1825 was 5 days. Travel time from Albany to Buffalo by stagecoach was 2 weeks. Travel time from Albany to Buffalo by railroad in the 1850s was about 1 day. Travel time from Albany to Buffalo by railroad is now 6 hours. The original part of New York City, Manhattan Island, offered an excellent port for seagoing vessels in the age of sailing ships. This was first of all because of the protected waters of New York Bay beyond the Narrows, 
where the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is today. This is the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Looking back into the New York Harbor. Secondly, both the North and East Rivers are tidal in nature. Flowing in one direction as the tide comes in and reversing direction as the tide goes out. This made it easier for sailing vessels to enter the port regardless of wind conditions. All of this was carved out during the last ice age that ended some 10,000 to 20,000 years ago. This is the area of North America covered by ice during the last ice age. Note that the glaciers extend down to the present location of New York City. The ice shape the present rivers and bays around the city. This is the Hudson River with a view of Jersey City. Engraving scanned from the 1890 book, Great Cities of the World. The East River is a tidal strait in New York City connecting Upper New York Bay on its south end to Long Island Sound on its north end. It separates Long Island, including the boroughs of Queens and Brooklyn, from the island of Manhattan and the Bronx in reference to its connection to Long Island Sound. It was once also known as the Sound River. The East River is a tidal strait in New York City connecting Upper New York Bay on its south end to Long Island Sound on its north end. It separates Long Island, including the boroughs of Queens and Brooklyn, from the island of Manhattan and the Bronx in reference to its connection to Long Island Sound. It was once also known as the Sound River. An Erie Canal through the Mohawk Valley would establish an all-water transportation route from New York City up the Hudson River to Albany, and then on the Erie Canal from Albany to Lake Erie near Buffalo. Construction on the Erie Canal started in 1817. By 1825 the canal was completed at a cost of little over $7 million. This is a canal construction bond. Governor DeWitt Clinton and the state of New York were able to build a waterway that was 4 feet deep, 40 feet wide, and 363 miles long, connecting the Hudson River at Albany to Lake Erie near Buffalo. The canal was the most ambitious engineering project undertaken anywhere in the country up to that time. The Erie Canal and Hudson River water route opened up the vast and fertile Midwest and linked it to the east coast of the U.S. at New York City. Agricultural products from the Midwest could now be shipped inexpensively to New York City and then to other ports along the east coast in Europe. It was the first transportation route between the eastern seaboard, New York City, and the western interior, Great Lakes of the United States faster than carts pulled by draft animals and cut transport costs by about 95 percent. Manufactured European products could now be shipped to New York City and then inexpensively to the Midwest. New York City was the center of all of this trade and grew rapidly to become the largest city in the U.S. In addition, Large numbers of immigrants came from Europe to New York City. In addition, large numbers of immigrants came from Europe. By 1831, as many as 1,000 immigrants a day passed through Buffalo on the way west. However, many immigrants stayed in New York City, giving it a large and cosmopolitan immigrant population. In 1840, just 15 years after the Erie Canal's opening, New York City's population increased from second place among U.S. ports to first place, ahead of the long time later Philadelphia. Thus, this rise to prominence of New York City, together with the financial power and various immigrant groups, produced the phenomenon known as Broadway. Boston. Philadelphia, and Baltimore did not have the easy access to markets to the West as compared to New York City. 
The canal fostered a population surge in western New York State, opened regions further west to settlement, and was a prime factor in the rise of New York City as the chief U.S. port. There were 83 locks along the canal, each 90 feet by 15 feet, 27 meters by 4.5 meters. Maximum canal boat displacement was 75 tons, 68 metric tons. This is the profile of the Erie Canal and some subsidiary canals. Note the many locks along the route. Lake Erie is 572 feet above sea level, whereas the Hudson River near Albany is only 1.3 feet above sea level. This is the profile of the Oswego Canal that connects the Erie Canal to Lake Ontario. This again shows the profile of the Oswego Canal that connects the Erie Canal to Lake Ontario. This is the section of the Erie Canal between Oneida Lake and the Hudson River near Albany. Lock 17 has a lift of 40 and a half feet. This was the highest in the New York Canal system and the highest in the world when built in 1912. This is Lock 17, with a lift of 40 and a half feet, the highest in the New York Canal system. The History of the Erie Canal The extraordinary success of the Bridgewater Canal in Britain, completed in 1761 to connect a coal mine to Manchester, led to a frenzy of canal building in England late in the 18th century. The idea of a canal or artificially improved waterway to tie the East Coast to the new western settlements was in the air. These are canals in England. Cadwallader Colden first proposed using the Mohawk River Valley in 1724. This shows the Hudson and Mohawk watersheds. George Washington led a serious effort to turn the Potomac River into a navigable link to the West, sinking substantial energy and capital into the Potomac Company from 1785 until his death 15 years later. Christopher Coles, who was familiar with the Bridgewater Canal, surveyed the Mohawk River Valley, and made a presentation to the New York State Legislature in 1784 proposing a canal from Albany to Lake Ontario. The proposal drew considerable attention and some action, but the effort would ultimately come to nothing. Governor Morris and Elkina Watson were other early proponents of a canal along the Mohawk, whose efforts led to the creation of the Western Inland Lock Navigation Company, which took the first steps to improve navigation on the Mohawk. The company was to prove that private financing was inadequate for a task of such scope. The canal proponent whose efforts would lead directly to the canal was the entrepreneurial Jesse Hulley, who imagined being able to grow vast quantities of grain in the upstate New York plains then largely unsettled, for sale on the eastern seaboard. Poor Waver. He went bankrupt trying to ship it to the coast. While sitting in the Canandaigua debtor's prison, he started pressing for constructing a canal running along the Mohawk River Valley. Hawley had strong support from Joseph Ellicott, agent for the Holland Land Company in Batavia. Ellicott realized that a canal would add immense value to the land he was selling in the western part of the state. Ellicott later became the first canal commissioner. The Mohawk River, a tributary to the Hudson, runs in a glacial meltwater channel across the northern reaches of the Appalachians, separating them in New York State into the Catskills and Adirondacks. The Mohawk Valley was the only cut across the Appalachians north of Alabama and pointed almost directly from the already widely used Hudson River on the east to either Lake Ontario or Lake Erie on the west. From Fay, 
much of the interior and many settlements would be accessible on the lakes. The problem was that the land rose about 600 feet, 183 meters, from the Hudson River at Albany, New York to Lake Erie. Locks at the time could handle a change of up to 12 feet, 3.5 meters. So at least 50 locks would be required along the 360-mile canal. Any such canal would cost a fortune even today. But in 1800, such an undertaking was barely imaginable. President Jefferson, calling it a little short of madness, thought the proposal was ridiculous and rejected it. Nevertheless, Hawley managed to interest the governor, DeWitt Clinton, and after surveying, the plan went ahead. Due to the overwhelming perception that the plan was absurd, the project became known as Clinton's Folly or Clinton's Ditch. In 1817, Clinton successfully convinced the New York State Legislature to authorize the funds for building the canal. The Continental Divide in Locks This shows the continental divides in North America. To go from New York City and the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes, a canal must go over the St. Lawrence Divide. South and east of the St. Lawrence Divide, the rivers flow into the Atlantic Ocean on the eastern seaboard of the U.S. North and west of the Divide are the Great Lakes, whose waters flow into the St. Lawrence River, which then empties into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and then the Atlantic Ocean. The Erie Canal ascended from its starting point on the Hudson River up the Mohawk Valley and then, Approaching Lake Erie went over the St. Lawrence Divide to the lake. As was shown before, this is the profile of the Erie Canal. Lake Erie is 572 feet above sea level, whereas the Hudson River near Albany is only 1.3 feet above sea level. Due to this great elevation change, 83 locks were needed along the route. Although the elevation change is the same, the New York State Barge Canal, which was started in 1905 and completed in 1918, has only 35 locks. This is the profile of the New York State Barge Canal, which has 35 locks. The reduction in the number of locks from 83 in the original Erie Canal to 35 in the New York State Barge Canal is mainly due to the larger lift of the newer locks in the original Erie Canal. The lifts in the locks were generally around 30 feet. In the region of Little Falls, the old Erie Canal had a set of four locks. These were replaced by a single lock number 17 in the New York State Barge Canal with a lift of 40.5 feet. It is the highest in the canal system, and at the time, it was the highest lift in the world. We will next have a short video clip on the Erie Canal locks and on lock 17. The Mohawk River drops through a series of steep rapids at Little Falls, New York. During the 1800s, boats had to pass through four sets of locks that climbed past the falls. They were replaced by a single massive lock in 1915. Lock 17 has the highest lift on the Erie Canal. It raises and lowers boats more than 40 feet. When it opened, it had the highest lift in the world. Lock 17 is a shaft lock enclosed on three sides by concrete. The downstream gate moves up and down, balanced by a big counterweight suspended by massive chains. Boats enter and exit through a slot in the downstream wall. It can be impressive and very damp for those on deck. The upstream gates swing open and closed like others on the barge canal. Profile Rock, just upstream of Lock 17, 
has been a landmark for travelers on the Erie Canal since the early 1800s. Today, the surrounding outcrops are a popular destination for rock climbers. With dramatic scenery, a historic downtown, welcoming public marina, fun shops and restaurants, and Lock 17, Little Falls is a great place to explore during your Erie Canal adventure. Experience the canals that transformed America. Please visit ErieCanalway.org. The Erie Canal, constructed between 1817 and 1825, is 363 miles long and has 83 locks to produce a total change in elevation of 655 feet up and down. This shows the operation of the canal locks. This again shows the operation of the canal locks. These are the canals in New York State. This compares the cost per ton of freight showing the significant reduction afforded by a canal compared to hauling over a dirt road. The canal consisted of a 40-foot, 12 meters, wide, 4-foot, 1.2 meters, deep cut, with the removed soil piled on the downhill side to form a walkway on that side. Barges, up to 3.5 feet, 1.07 meters, in draft would be pulled by horses and later mules on the walkway. With only one towpath for traffic in both directions. When barges passed each other there was a quick unhitching and rehitching of the draft animal teams while the barges continued by momentum. The sides of the cut would be lined with stone, while the bottom would be covered with clay. The stonework required hundreds of German masons to be brought in, who would later go on to build many of New York's famous buildings when the canal was completed. Initially, horses were used to pull the canal boats. Mules soon replaced them. Mules require less rest than horses, eat rougher food, and are smarter. Mules won't walk off a plank or bridge, whereas horses will. These are scenes along the canal. Construction began July 4, 1817, at Rome, New York. The first 15-mile, 24-kilometer section between Rome and Utica opened two years later. The canal would not have been finished for another 30 years at this rate. The main problems were cutting the trees through miles of virgin forest and moving the dirt, which was much slower than expected. Solutions were discovered. Trees were pulled down with a rope thrown over the top of the tree and then winched down, and the stumps were pulled out with a huge tripod mounted winch. Mule-pulled carts were filled from much larger wheelbarrows to clear the dirt. A three-man team with mules could now build a mile-long stretch in a year. The men who planned and oversaw construction were novices, both as surveyors and engineers. As there were no civil engineers in the United States at the time. James Geddes and Benjamin Wright, who laid out the route were judges who had gained experience in surveying in settling boundary disputes. 
Geddes had only used a surveying instrument for a few hours. Canvas White was a 27-year-old amateur engineer who talked Clinton into letting him go to Britain at his own expense to study the canal system there. Nathan Roberts was a math teacher and land speculator. Yet yeah, these men carried the Erie Canal up the Niagara Escarpment at Lockport. Maneuvered it onto a towering embankment to cross over Irondequot Creek. Spanned the Genesee River for it on an awesome aqueduct. And carved a route for it out of the solid rock between Little Falls and Schenectady, and all of those venturesome designs worked precisely as planned. Construction continued at an increased rate as new workers arrived, but halted completely when the canal reached the Montezuma Swamp in 1819 at the outlet of Cayuga Lake west of Syracuse, New York, when over 1,000 workers died of swamp fevers. Work continued on the downhill side towards the Hudson. And when the swamp froze over in the winter, the crews all worked to complete the section right across the swamps. This is an upstream view of the downstream lock, Lock 32. Pittsford, New York. This is the Great Embankment. After Montezuma, the next obstacle was crossing the Niagara Escarpment. An 80-foot, 24-meter, wall of hard dolomitic limestone. To rise to the level of Lake Erie, the Niagara Escarpment was a steep ridge that had to be surmounted by the canal to reach the Lake Erie end of the canal. The route followed the channel of a creek that had cut a ravine steeply down the escarpment with a pi of five locks in a series, thus giving rise to the community of Lockport. The final leg of the canal had to be cut as much as 30 feet, 9 meters, through another limestone layer, the Onondaga Ridge. Much of that section was blasted with black powder. The inexperience of the crews often led to accidents and sometimes rocks falling on nearby homes. This shows the location of the locks of the Erie Canal near Lockport. The 12-foot lift locks had a total lift of 60 feet, exiting into a deeply cut channel. This is the original five-step lock structure crossing the Niagara Escarpment at Lockport, now without gates and used as a cascade for excess water. A modern 40-foot wide, 12-meter, Single step lock is to the left, replacing another identical and original five step lock. This is the five step series of locks on the Erie Canal at Lockport, called the Flight of Five. This is the Flight of Five. This is one of the five step series of locks on the Erie Canal at Lockport, called the Flight of Five. We will next have a short video clip on the Erie Canal, then and now and the Lockport Locks. In 1825, workers completed construction of some of the most dramatic structures on the Erie Canal. The Lockport Flight was a staircase of five side-by-side -side locks that climbed the rocky face of the Niagara Escarpment. They raised and lowered boats over 50 feet and opened the first all-water connection between the Atlantic Ocean and the upper Great Lakes. The Erie Canal was an immediate success. Ten years after it opened, New Yorkers voted to enlarge it with a deeper channel and bigger locks that could pass boats carrying more cargo. The enlargement program took many years but the canal had to remain operational throughout. At Lockport, workers built a new flight of locks next to the existing pair. We're traveling up that set now. Once this set was operating, they replaced the 1825 locks with another set of newer and larger dimensions. The Lockport flight was an engineering marvel that attracted dignitaries, artists, and ordinary travelers from throughout the world. Many stopped here on their way to see the natural wonder at Niagara Falls, about 20 miles to the west. 
These statues depict some of the lock tenders who once operated valves and heavy timber gates by hand. In 1914, the southern part of the flight was dismantled to make way for even bigger locks. Barge Canal locks 34 and 35 raise and lower boats about the same distance as their stone towpath era counterparts, but strong steel gates and concrete chambers allow the lift to be done with two locks rather than five. Electric motors now operate gates and valves instead of human muscle. Today, you can see two centuries of canal engineering operating side by side. Concrete and steel locks from the early 1900s remain in active service, passing boats carrying cargo and vacationers from the Atlantic Ocean to the upper Great Lakes, along with tour boats that carry passengers up and down the flight several times each day. The five stone lock chambers, built during the 1840s, are being restored with replica hand-operated gates that are demonstrated regularly. The Lockport flight is an engineering marvel and an exciting place to visit, just as it has been for world travelers since the 1820s. Experience the canals that transformed America. Please visit ErieCanalway.org. Lockport's deep cut the final obstacle in the original Erie Canal. Lockport, the deep cut at Pendleton in particular, was the last section of the Erie Canal to be completed. The flight of five at Lockport was an engineering marvel all right, but the real obstacle here, the one that delayed the opening of the canal well into the fall of 1825, was in the countryside just south and west of town. In order for the locks to work, it was critical that the water of Lake Erie flow by gravity all the way from Buffalo to fill those locks. But there was a problem. There was a high spot in the countryside near today's Pendleton, where the bedrock rose like a giant dam, blocking any flow from Lake Erie to the locks at Lockport. Water had to flow through there. To accomplish that, workers had to chisel by hand and to blast without dynamite, which hadn't been invented yet, a channel measuring 40 feet deep for seven miles. Of course, we know today that they did finish it. And when they were finished, since the canal itself was finished, many of the workers decided to settle down and to raise their families where they were. This is the deep cut. This is the deep cut. This is the deep cut. Two villages competed to be the canal terminus. Black Rock on the Niagara River in Buffalo, New York at the eastern tip of Lake Erie. Buffalo expended great energy to widen and deepen Buffalo Creek to make it navigable and to create a harbor at its mouth. Buffalo won over Black Rock and quickly grew into a great city, eventually swallowing its former competitor. The Grand Celebration of the Opening of the Erie Canal The middle section from Utica to Salina, Syracuse was completed in 1820 and traffic on that section started up directly. The eastern section of the canal, 250 miles, 402 kilometers, from Rochester to Albany, was opened on September 10, 1823, to great fanfare. The 64-mile, 103 kilometers, north-south section from Waterfleet to Lake Champlain was declared open on the same date in 1824 even before the entire canal was completed. A detailed pocket guide for the tourist and traveler along the line of the canals and the interior commerce of the state of New York was published for the benefit of eager travelers and land speculators, possibly America's first published tour guide.
Work was completed on November 4, 1825. Officially, the event was marked by a statewide grand celebration, culminating in successive cannon shots along the canal length, which took 90 minutes to travel from Buffalo to New York City. A flotilla of boats left from Buffalo, led by Governor DeWitt Clinton aboard the Seneca Chief, taking 10 days to travel to New York City. Where Clinton ceremonially poured Lake Erie water into the New York Harbor in The Wedding of the Waters. The Erie Canal was the first transportation route faster than carts pulled by draft animals between the eastern seaboard of the United States and the western interior. The Erie Canal cut transport costs into what was then wilderness by about 95%. The canal resulted in a massive population surge in western New York and opened regions further west to increased settlement. This is more of the announcement of the grand celebration of the opening of the Erie Canal. The Route of the Erie Canal These are the canals of the state of New York. These are the canals of the state of New York and the profile of the Erie Canal. The Erie Canal began on the west side of the Hudson River at Albany and ran north to a split with the Champlain Canal at Troy. At Cahoos, it turned west along the south shore of the Mohawk River, crossing to the north side at Crescent and again to the south at Rexford Flats. The canal continued west near the south shore of the Mohawk River to Rome, where the Mohawk turns north. This is the aqueduct of the Mohawk River at Rexford. This is the section of the Erie Canal from the Hudson River, near Albany to the Oswego Canal near Syracuse. This is the section of the Erie Canal from the Oswego Canal near Syracuse to Lake Erie near Buffalo. At Rome, the canal continued west parallel to Wood Creek, which flows from Oneida Lake, and turned southwest and west cross country to avoid the lake. From Canastota West, it ran roughly along the north, lower, edge of the Niagara Escarpment, passing through Syracuse and Rochester. At Lockport, the canal turned southwest to rise to the top of the escarpment, using the ravine of 18 Mile Creek. The canal continued south-southwest to Pendleton, where it turned west and southwest, mainly using the channel of Tonawanda Creek. From Tonawanda south to Buffalo, it ran just east of the Niagara River, emptying into the river in downtown Buffalo. Enlargements and improvements. Problems developed but were quickly solved. Leaks developed along the entire length of the canal, but these were sealed with newly invented concrete that hardened underwater. Erosion on the clay bottom proved to be a problem, and the speed was limited to 4 miles per hour, 6 kilometers per hour. Additional canals, called feeder canals, were soon added to the coverage, including the Cayuga Seneca south to the Finger Lakes, the Oswego from Three Rivers north to Lake Ontario at Oswego, and the Champlain running north from Troy to Lake Champlain. The annual net profit on the Erie Canal over its first decade of operation, from 1826 to 1835, was about 8% of its total construction cost per year. The Erie Canal helped make New York City such a large trading center that it accounted for 50% of all U.S. foreign trade and duties collected. Transportation costs from Buffalo to New York City in 1817. When construction began on the Erie Canal, we three times the market value of a bushel of wheat and six times that of a bushel of corn. Many famous authors wrote about the canal, including Herman Melville, Francis Trollope, Nathaniel Hawthorne, 
Harriet B. Chesto, Mark Twain, Samuel Hopkins Adams, and the Marquis de Lafayette, and many tales and songs we written about life on the canal. The city of Chicago, among other Great Lakes cities, recognized the commercial importance of the canal to their economies. And two West Loop streets are named Canal and Clinton, for canal proponent DeWitt Clinton. The famous song Low Bridge was written in 1905 by Thomas S. Allen, after Erie Canal barge traffic was converted from mule power to engine power, raising traffic speed above 15 miles per day. The tune is sadly nostalgic. Also known as Low Bridge, Everybody Down, the Erie Canal song, 15 years on the Erie Canal, and Mule Named Saul. The song memorializes the years from 1825 to 1880 when the mule barges made boom towns out of Utica, Rome, Syracuse, Rochester, and Buffalo, and transformed New York into the Empire State. The song has become part of the folk repertoire, recorded by folk singers like Len Yarbera, Pete Seeger and the Weavers, the Kingston Trio, and Western artists like the Sons of the Pioneers. I got a mule and her name is Sal. Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal. She's a good old worker, a good old pal. Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal. We've hauled some barges in our day. Filled with lumber, coal and hay And we know every step of the way From Albany to Buffalo Low bridge, everybody down Low bridge, for we're coming to a town And you'll always know your neighbor You'll always know your pal If you ever navigated on the Erie Canal We better get along on our way, old gal Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal Cause bet your life I'll never part with Sal Fifteen miles on the Erie Canal Get up there, mule, here comes a lock And we'll make Rome about six o'clock One more trip, then back we'll go Right on back home to Buffalo Low bridge, everybody down Low bridge, for we're coming to a town And you'll always know your neighbor You'll always know your pal If you ever navigated on the Erie Canal Competition with Railroads The Mohawk and Hudson Railroad opened in 1831 bypassing the slowest part of the canal between Albany and Schenectady. Other railroads were soon chartered and built to continue the line west to Buffalo. This sign commemorates the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad as the first railroad chartered in the U.S. It ran between Albany and Schenectady starting in 1831. This is a picture showing the early days of the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad. This is an advertisement of the fare on the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad. The fare was 25 cents to go from Albany to Schenectady. In 1842, a continuous line, which would become the New York Central Railroad and its Auburn Road in 1853, was open the whole way to Buffalo. As the railroad served the same general route as the Erie Canal but provided for faster travel, Passengers soon switched to it. Po Waver. As late as 1852, the canal carried 13 times more freight tonnage than all the railroads in New York State combined. It continued to compete well with the railroads through 1882 when tolls were abolished. 
The New York Central was known as the Water Level Route, as its main line to New York City ran along the Hudson River and the shores of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. The New York West Shore and Buffalo Railway was completed in 1884 as a route running closely parallel to the canal in the New York Central Railroad. However, it went bankrupt and was acquired the following year by the New York Central. The Erie Canal has three distinct historical phases. The first phase was the original canal completed in 1825, in which the power source was animal power, mostly mules. The canal was expanded in 1862. The third phase started in 1905 when construction of the New York State Barge Canal began. In this case, Animal Pui was replaced by Machine Pui. The original design planned for an annual tonnage of 1.5 million tons, 1.36 million metric tons, which was immediately exceeded. An ambitious program to improve the canal was begun in 1834. During this massive series of construction projects, known as the first enlargement, the canal was widened to 70 feet and deepened to 7 feet. Locks were widened and rebuilt in new locations, and many new aqueducts were constructed. The canal was also straightened and slightly rerouted in some stretches, resulting in the abandonment of short segments of the original 1825 canal. This first enlargement was completed in 1862 with further minor enlargements in later decades. Today, the reconfiguration of the canal created during the first enlargement is commonly referred to as the Improved Erie Canal, or the Old Erie Canal, to distinguish it from the canal's modern-day course. Existing remains of the 1825 canal abandoned during the enlargement are sometimes referred to today as Clinton's Ditch the popular nickname for the entire Erie Canal project during its original 1817 to 1825 construction. This is the Erie Canal in Rochester, New York in 1907. These are weigh locks, which are locks used to weigh the canal barges on the Erie Canal in Rochester. This is the present-day Erie Canal near Bushnell Basin. Southeast of Rochester, New York. The success of the Erie Canal led to the growth of major urban areas along the canal and the Hudson River. The Erie Canal made boom towns of Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Rome, Utica, and Schenectady. It made an immense contribution to the wealth and importance of New York City and New York State. The impact of the Erie Canal went much further, increasing trade throughout the nation by opening eastern and overseas markets to Midwest farm products and encouraging Western immigration. New ethnic Irish communities formed in some towns along its route after completion as Irish immigrants were a large portion of the labor force involved in its construction. Competition with other canals Competition As the canal brought travelers to New York City, it took them away from a ports such as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Baltimore. Those cities and the states containing them sought ways to compete with the Erie Canal. In Pennsylvania, the main line of public works was a combined canal and railroad running west from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh on the Ohio River, which opened in 1834 in Maryland. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad ran west to Wheeling, West Virginia on the Ohio River and was completed in 1853. Although Boston was a leading city in early America, the Berkshire Mountains in western Massachusetts and the Adirondacks in eastern New York State blocked a canal route to the west.
Philadelphia was the largest city in colonial America. The Allegheny Mountains, however, were a major barrier to canal building and the major rivers in western Pennsylvania. The Delaware and the Susquehanna mainly ran north to south. The Pennsylvania Canal, which connected Philadelphia to the Ohio River at Pittsburgh, was completed in 1834. However, by then, New York City had an unbeatable head start with its Erie Canal completed almost ten years earlier. In the case of Charleston, South Carolina it was much further from the major European ports than New York City, and the distance to the Midwest was also much greater. So it was never a serious contender. The remarkable success of the Erie Canal inspired the building of the many other canals in America. These are major canals built in the U.S. in the 19th century. This is a chronological list of the most significant canals in the U.S. used by settlers. These are the U.S. and Canadian canals to the Great Lakes. This is the population density in the U.S. in 1790. Almost all of the population was concentrated near the eastern seaboard bordering the Atlantic Ocean. These are travel times in the early 1800s. Before canals and railroads, travel times were exceptionally long. These are colonial roads and trails. Note that almost all of these were east of the Appalachian Mountains. Before the canals and railroads, travel times were very long. These are travel times in 1830. Completing the Erie Canal and other canals in the east significantly decreased the travel time to the Great Lakes region. These are travel times in 1857. The railroad significantly decreased the travel times east of the Mississippi River. This is the population growth of the U.S. from 1830 to 1920 showing an increase of 15 million in 1830 to 105 million in 1920. Much of this growth was made possible by the canals and later by the extensive railroad network. This shows the population density of the U.S. in 1820, 1840, and 1860. The rapid expansion westward was due mainly to the canals and later to the extensive railroad network. This is the population density of the U.S. in 1820. This is the population density of the U.S. in 1840. This is the population density of the U.S. in 1860. This compares the miles one ton can be carried per gallon of fuel by truck, rail, and barge. This is the comparative fuel consumption in megajoules per ton kilometer by road, rail, and sea. Size is the key to water transport sufficiency. The capacity, 1,500 tons, of an inland barge which can carry five times its weight, is impressive, and the entire industry has enormous capacity. The cargo capacity of a barge is 15 times greater than one rail car and 60 times greater than one semi-trailer. To move the same amount of cargo transported by a standard tow, 15 barges, would require a freight train 2.75 miles long or a line of truck stretching more than 35 miles. Recommended videos part 1, the Erie Canal. Recommended video, the Erie Canal. Recommended video, 200 years on the Erie Canal. Recommended video, How the Erie Canal Transformed America.
Recommended video, America's Heritage, The Erie Canal, 1957. Recommended video, The Building of the Erie Canal. For a water level experience of the Erie Canal, view these time lapse tours. It's the next best thing to being Fay. Recommended video, time lapse trip through the Erie Canal. Recommended video, a day on the Erie Canal, time lapse. Recommended video, two days running the Erie Canal New York in three minutes. 20 seconds time lapse. Recommended video, YouTube navigation. Table of contents, canals, part one, the Erie Canal. Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.